what is Pan-Africanism? Is it about states? Is it about governments? Is it about the seizure of political power? The point is, Pan-Africanism has been defined by every generation by the task of dignity. Let me attempt to offer one definition of Pan-Africanism today. Pan-Africanism arose as a philosophy to restore the humanity and dignity of the African person. And in fact, Pan-Africanism had to do with the question of all humans. The concept of dignity has gone through many iterations. We have now liberated ourselves from the hierarchical principles that are embedded in European thought that suggest that Europe has arisen at the point of giving civilization to other human beings. I think Pan-Africanism has helped us to liberate from the kind of European thinking about Europe being at the top of the human chain. But of course, there are so many Pan-Africanists in the 19th and 20th century who believed in that conception of hierarchy and whether that conception of hierarchy is represented in liberal democratic thinking about democracy, politics, human rights, and the liberal democratic thinking which came out of Western um, philosophy that denied the basic right of Africans so that the Newtonian principles of simplicity, determinism, and predictability, whether it's articulated as Marxism or liberal democracy deny the prior existence of African philosophy, of African knowledge, of Africans as human beings. So the challenge within Pan-Africanism was how to philosophically return Africans to that state where they could be agents. They could be agents of their own change as human beings. And ontologically, the philosophy of Pan-Africanism was always embedded in the masses of the oppressed peoples because the enslavement of the African peoples from where Pan-Africanism came meant that ontologically the Africans had a spiritual worldview of themselves as human beings that transcended the ideas of those who enslaved them. So it was only in the mind of this president of the United States who had a black wife, what's his name? That's his name. Mm -hmm. Who had children by this black woman? You know him? You know the story? Jefferson. Huh? Jefferson. Je Jefferson. Jefferson. We study Jefferson as someone who promotes liberal democracy, about rights and freedom and liberty. We have to study Jefferson in terms of his relationship to black people and black women. So that the philosophy that came out of the educated strata about Pan-Africanism was very different from the philosophy of Pan-Africanism that came from the ordinary black people who entered revolt. So one day, African people were enslaved in Haiti. The next day, they could organize an army of politics, defeat France, defeat Spain, defeat Britain, and organize a modern state. And that Haitian revolution, which is the basis of modern Pan-Africanism, is written out of the history of revolution. Because black people cannot make revolution. And so the question in Pan-Africanism in the 19th and 20th century is how do you develop a conception of Pan-Africanism where Africans could have dignity. So during the time of slavery, Pan-Africanism meant freedom from slavery. During the time of Jim Crow, Pan-Africanism meant freedom from colonialism, freedom from lynching, freedom from all forms of rape and sexual oppression. And it was in the interwar years when the Pan-African movement of the grassroots people of the Rastafari, of the peasants and workers in Africa gave rise to institutions within the United Kingdom like the International African Service Bureau or the West African Students Movement and the United States, the Council on African Affairs. And when those institutions like the Council on African Affairs and International African Service Bureau developed, 
the Europeans who dismissed Pan-Africanism began to write about Pan-Africanism. And so you had people like Melville Hertzkowitz and those who enter the field of what is now called African studies writing about Pan-Africanism. And they said, well, you know people like Dubois, they can't really write about Africa because when you write about Africa and your Africans, you're too emotional. So you can't really deal with Africa, so you must leave Africa to the experts. So, so people like Joseph Nye became an authority on Pan-Africanism. David After became an authority on Pan-Africanism. And there was an attempt to isolate and to dismiss that Pan-African writing that came from George Padmore, C.L.R. James, W.B. Du Bois, and those forces that were actively linking Pan-Africanism to an anti-imperialist, anti-racist, anti-militarist position. So we have within the academy two different traditions of Pan-Africanism. That is a Pan-Africanism that seeks to serve those that oppress Africans, and those who seek to distort the history of Africa, and those who want Pan-Africanism to serve the process of liberation. And so within the university, we have seen that this year, 2011, 50 years since they assassinated Patrice Lumumba. And after the assassination of Patrice Lumumba, the universities went over in overdrive, not only to physically assassinate Patrice Lumumba, but to intellectually assassinate him. So that the assassination of Patrice Lumumba gives rise to a tradition of intellectual work on the Congo where the Congolese people are blamed for the destruction. It's not by accident that the book on the rape and genocide of the Congo by Adam Oschild did not come out of an African studies project, King Leopold's Goals. And even within the African studies enterprise, we know of the struggles within Britain over the question of Kenya. When Caroline Elkins brought out her book on imperial reckoning, what was the response of the British Academy? to the rape and destruction of the people of Kenya. Because African studies at present is funded, and now they have a new project in England called the Nairobi Report, where they are, there's a whole new thrust in the social science to militarize the social science. So while funds are drying up for research by African scholars, we have what is called the US Africa Command setting up its social science research center in Stuttgart. And the US Africa Command social science research center have more resources than universities and foundations to be able to unleash the kind of research to predispose Africans to support what they call the war on terror or to intervene in Africa to fight China in Africa. Why would Africans need Europeans or Americans to tell them about Chinese in Africa. If there's a problem with Chinese in Africa, shouldn't the Africans themselves know about the Chinese to be able to deal with China in Africa? 